Hey, and welcome to Church Anywhere. My name is Megan, and I'm one of the pastors here. I am so excited because we have a great service planned for you today. In just a minute, I'm going to send you over to the auditorium for worship. After worship, you will come back here with me for communion. So now would be a great time to grab your communion supplies. Don't forget that we have a care team ready to chat and pray with you. You will see them commenting below. So let's get the conversation started. Drop in the comments who you had in the finals on your March Madness bracket. Are any of your teams left? Because I don't know about you, but my bracket is busted. It's complete madness. See what I did there? Anyways, today Patrick will be continuing on in our I Will Take Up My Cross series. We're also going to hear from one of my friends, Tammy, and she is sharing part of her story. And oh my goodness, it is powerful. So make sure you stick around to hear more from her. So wherever you're watching from, get ready because Church Anywhere starts right now.
Somebody give a praise today. Come on, church. He's worthy of all our praise and adoration we sing today.
pray with me? Jesus, would you remind us this morning, wherever we are, where we stand in this room, that there is such power in your name, that there is such power to be found at the feet, at your feet. Lord, only you can bring the peace that our hearts need, the, the, the peace that our world needs. There's power in just speaking your name. Lord, you are worthy when we find ourselves unworthy. You are faithful when we are unfaithful and wandering. You are loving when the last thing we are able to do is love. Thank you for being the name and the place that we can run to and cling to. Would you remind us of the power of the name of Jesus this morning? It's in that name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Next, we're going to move on into a time of communion. As we've been in the series, I Will, the last few weeks we have been focused on I Will Take Up My Cross. When we focus on taking up our own cross, what better way to look back and look at the cross that Jesus took up? Let's stop and remember the price that he paid so we could freely come to our Heavenly Father. Let's take communion together. week, I had the awesome opportunity to meet with a lady on Zoom. I met her through TikTok. Yes, I know TikTok. And I'll be honest with you, that was one of the last places I thought I would be doing ministry. But here I am, eight months in, and I've been able to have the privilege to pray with over 500 people. It gets better than that. My friend Jess, who I spoke with this week, along with many other of my new friends, are watching the service right now with you. There is real impact being made through relationships, and I've personally seen how God is working throughout their lives. It's through your giving that we're able to reach people in unconventional ways. And I want to personally thank you for partnering with us. If you want to give, the links are posted below. Now I'm going to send you over to Patrick to hear a message. And don't forget, Tammy's going to be sharing her story after. What is your identity? See, that's the big question for today. I believe that our identity shifts as life goes on. The way that you define yourself and the way that others tend to define you changes as life goes on. In your childhood, it's usually a family identity. Growing up, I was a Crawford. I was one of the many, many, many Crawfords. And more specifically, I was Quinlan's son. But as you grow older, at least with your self-given identity, defining moments tend to shift your identity more than anything else. One particular defining moment happened in my freshman year of high school when I knew that I felt this call to vocational ministry, the call to be a pastor. That shaped the way that my friends saw me and the way that I saw myself. In June of 2018, another defining moment. My identity shifted again as I became husband to Abigail. And then in May, 
This May, another defining moment will hit the Crawford household as another piece of my own identity puzzle will take place as I become a dad. Like I said, our identity is constantly changing and being shaped by these defining moments in our lives. I bring this up because our text today is grounded in and is all about identity. This language of identity surrounds it. The natural question to ask and to answer is this, who are you? Who are you? Really, go ahead and answer that right now in the comment section below. How would you identify yourself? What adjectives and nouns would you use to do that? I'm curious as to how you would describe yourself. Was your first identifier your family? I'm the wife of so-and-so, the mother of blank. Or maybe it was vocation. I'm a farmer, a small business owner. I am an astrophysicist. Did you define yourself by location? For me right now, it would be, I am an American. I'm a Hoosier. I'm a Cordonite. Cordiner? A Cordonin. An accordion. I don't know what we call ourselves. I'm from Cordon. That makes it a little bit easier. Maybe your identifiers weren't as hunky-dory or easy. Maybe like so many of us, our sins and the evil inside of us have clouded what our identity is. And so when I asked to describe yourself, at least in your mind and your thoughts, you heard words like addict or cheater, sinner, unlovable, not good enough. How would you describe yourself? What is your identity? Who are you? That question actually sets up the context for our scripture today because that's the question Jesus asks his closest followers. Who am I? We'll be in Matthew 16 for today, so if you have your Bibles, you can find your way there. Let me set the stage a little bit for what has happened and what has gotten us here. In the chapter before this, Jesus is teaching to a multiple multitude of people. Thousands of people are gathered to hear him teach and preach. There's the famous feeding of the 4,000. And after that meal, Jesus and his disciples cross to the other side of the lake. And it's at that point where they finally get some small group time, which they haven't had in quite a while. So much has happened since it was just them together alone. Jesus has healed people. He has driven out demons. He has walked on water. He fed 5,000 on one occasion and, and 4,000 after that. He has preached and spoken and taught and amounts massed crowds upon crowds, thousands upon thousands. All of this action is rising up to the climax, to the greatest moment of the Gospels. Jesus looks around to his closest friends, his closest followers, the people he trusts the most and says, all right, guys, are people getting it? Are the crowds getting it? Are they understanding my purpose here? Who do they say that I am? The disciples name some of the examples of lesser prophets, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah. Jesus goes, okay, set that aside. More important question. I'm more concerned about you. Do you get it? Do you understand my purpose here? Who do you say that I am? Peter gets it or at least gives the correct answer. You are the Messiah, the one we've waited for, the one will save us. You are the son of God. If we couldn't look ahead in the story, if we didn't know the rest of it, we would assume that this announcement of Jesus as Messiah would be the springboard for happy trails ahead. It would only be up and to the right from here on out. Jesus would continue to heal. He would continue to preach. He would continue to restore goodness back to creation. The crowd of thousands would turn into tens of thousands. And sooner or later, Jesus would be the head of the restored nation of Israel, just as the disciples thought was prophesied. Yet instead, we find a quick 180 in the next few verses as Jesus asks for secrecy from the disciples about his messianic identity. He takes it another step further and predicts and prophesies his own death and suffering. And you've got to feel for the disciples in this moment. They're all like, oh my gosh, we've heard stories and legends of a person, a Messiah to come, a person so great and awesome that he would restore the kingdom of Israel. And he's here. He's finally arrived. And oh my gosh, I get to be one of his closest followers. Wait, no, not only that, I get to be friends with him. Wait, hold on. I think I missed something. What's Jesus saying? I'm not allowed to tell anybody. I have to keep this a secret. Wait, 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 hold up. Death? Suffering? No, 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 no. That's all wrong. That's not the Messiah that I was looking for. That's not the Messiah that I had in my head. 
And it's in that mindset, in that swirling cloud of uncertainty that Jesus commands what we've been talking about for the last three months and we'll continue to talk about this year. Jesus defines what it means to be identified as a follower of the Messiah, what it means to follow this Messiah, the only one worth following. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in the exchange for their soul? The language and conversation here and throughout all of chapter 16 of Matthew is identity language. If you are to be identified by yourself and by others as a disciple, a follower, an apprentice to Jesus Christ, then you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow. And if those things aren't done, and if our identity is not centered around, or if it's identified by something completely less, Jesus gives us a pretty big warning here. Our souls are forfeit. The language of soul in verses 25 through 26 is identity language. A soul is all of who you are. A soul is you. Jesus is warning us in Matthew 16 against losing ourselves, our souls, our identifiers for the sake of the world, letting the world around us define us rather than allowing ourselves to to be identified by the Holy Spirit. Rather than allowing Jesus to identify us, we often allow our surroundings to identify us. Jesus tells us when that happens, when we try and gain the world or succeed in gaining the world, we forfeit our very selves, our existence, our souls. We've all seen this, and most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, have at least allowed this to be partly true. We allow our surroundings, the things around us to identify us rather than Christ, the one inside of us to define us. We identify ourselves by our families. If I can finally just be the best parent, my kids will grow up to be perfect adults and get into the best schools and play the most sports and get the best grades. I can finally host this identity of greatest parent. But what happens when teenagers rebel and things don't go as planned? Does your identity fade away? We identify ourselves by our jobs. If I put in the hours, if I rise to the top of the organizational chart, if I make the most commission, finally, my life will be worth it. But what happens when the promotion doesn't come, when people aren't buying what you're selling, or an economy just goes bad? Does your identity go down with it? And then there's that hidden part of us, that secret part of us, the negative self-talk that wants us to identify ourselves by the things that we hate about ourselves, or worse, the things and the sins that have a stranglehold on us. It was just a one-time sin. It couldn't and wouldn't affect me. I'm stronger, and by my willpower, I can overcome it when I want to, but now that same sin is popping up into my daily life. It's swallowing me whole. The first time, that one time, is the defining moment in our life that shapes and cultivates our identities. It was only one time. It was only one website, only one drink, only one look, only one, you can fill in the blank. I can't really decide whether it's an addiction or if it's something that I love and has become a part of who I am. And at that point, when it comes to sin, you're really saying the same thing. All of these identifiers, relationships, vocations, sins, all of it are all ways that we allow the surroundings, the world to identify us. And at times, we actively choose the world's definition for us. We allow the outside world to describe and identify us, turning us into the opposite of what Christ calls us to be. He wants to be the one to identify us. He wants to be the one who gives us the name son, daughter. And it's the same battle we saw play out just before these verses we read earlier. The battle of the world's identity versus Christ's identity. This battle actually led Jesus to talking about the forfeiture of a soul. This is what set up Jesus talking about the identity of a disciple. Growing up, my life was very divided. My parents divorced when I was a baby, and so I felt like I was just bouncing from home to home. As a little girl, I was exposed to so much. And one of those things at the age of 10 I was sexually abused by someone close to me. It started out in the beginning as a few times and then occurred to more times than not. I lived in constant fear of never knowing when it was gonna happen next. At the age of 16, I was dating a guy who I fell in love with. I was comfortable and so one night I shared with him what was happening in my life. 
While I finally felt free that someone else knew, I still had so much baggage I was carrying. He encouraged me to tell my parents, or he said he would. That night, I sat down at the kitchen table with my parents and told them that their daughter was being sexually abused for the past six years. While I thought my nightmare was over, it continued because I carried so much guilt and shame and blaming myself for the abuse. After high school graduation, I moved away to college and I started living a very different life. That life was drugs, alcohol, sex, and stealing. It was all about me and how to get my next fix. I thought I needed a man, and so I would do almost anything. I looked to the world to satisfy my needs, and all I got was more trouble. One of those nights ended in me being drugged and raped. I asked for it, I caused it, is what I told myself. Jason and I met when I was in college, and a few years later we were married. Shortly after, we welcomed three beautiful children into this world. Jason saw right through all the pain in my eyes, and he chose to stand by me and love me unconditionally. We moved to Corden, and I began searching for something. What I was searching for was Jesus. So through a friend, we were talking one night, and she invited us to 10 First Capital. So we gave it a try, but we really wasn't sure that this was where we belonged. Then January, I decided to come back, and it was just me that time. And that's the day that God revealed himself to me that this is where I was supposed to be. On that Sunday, I heard a pastor give his testimony, and I was just blown away how God can take a man in addiction and bring him into the light and show him Jesus. And I thought, maybe it's not too late for me. He prayed over me, and I left. A few days later, I kind of kept getting a feeling inside like, I needed help, um, but I wasn't sure what to do. And so I called that pastor that prayed over me. We met week after week. I was terrified to tell him, you know, the ugliness of my past and the sinful life I was living. But the one thing he told me was that he loved me. And if you ask him, it was almost like my face was like deer in headlights because I was like, how do you love me when you don't even know me? Um, that pastor's Donnie. Donnie walked alongside me for 16 months. We met week after week. Um, these sessions were hard. Many times I left like, is it worth it? Is it worth the pain that I'm going through reliving my past to try to heal and get better? Um, and many a times I thought it's not worth it. And so when I was on the deep end, he stepped in and helped me. I thought my next step was being baptized. I was baptized as a baby, but I thought I needed to do it as an adult. I really thought it would just fix everything, but it didn't. I still had the sinful life I was living. I still had the baggage, you know, of my past. And then May 31st is the day that I'll never forget, 2018. I was arrested and looking at many years in prison. It was no longer about me. I was hurting so many people around me and especially my husband, Jason. He sat in the courtroom and watched as the officer handcuffed me and took me away. I saw so much pain in his eyes that day, and this time I caused it. Can't blame anybody else, it was caused by me. I remember sitting, waiting on him to post my bond, and I cried out, and I truly cried out to Jesus that day. And he met me right where I was. That day, I prayed, and I made a promise to him, and I said, from this day forward, I'm going to take up my cross and I'm going to follow you no matter what. I know this journey is going to be hard, but there's going to be so much reward in the end. A few months later, I signed my plea agreement and was charged with a felony. I was devastated. We lost so much. Friends, reputation, my job. The next few years, I just spent this journey of seeking Jesus and trying to figure out who I was and what my identity is. I started just being around like-minded people, Christians that just loved me for who I was and didn't care about my past. It just blows me away that there are people out there in this community that just wanted to love on me. I mean, I had some that showed up for a probation violation meeting. It was six couples and they prayed with me before I went in. That's love, unconditional love, and they were there for me. They could have been anywhere else. It's hard to see the blessings when you're in the middle of a mess. 
But as I look up back on the past three years, I've seen God's hand at work at many of things in my life. A few of those things are in 2020, I joined the staff at First Capital. I never dreamed this is where I would be. Helping people find and follow Jesus, like that wasn't part of my priorities or my career plan. But I love how God's using me to further his kingdom. I also lead a couple microsites um, and I show these women who are incarcerated and going through a transitional living from being in jail and prison back into the world. I get to show them who Jesus is and that he forgives them and he loves them. And I get to walk alongside with them as, like Donnie did to me. It just blows my mind that how he can use such a past and he can take me and make me beautiful and give me an amazing story to help other people. If God can take a mess like me and use it for the good, he can do the same for you. it all Lord. every part of my world take this life and breathe on this heart that is now yours let's sing this together you can have it all Every part of my world Take this life and breathe on This heart that is now Surrendered everything 
Matthew 16, Peter identifies Jesus, not by vocation, location, or relation, and of course not by sin, but he identifies Jesus by what was inside of Jesus. Peter identifies Jesus by his soul. Here's verse 16. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And the most beautiful, the most moving piece happens just as Peter finishes his answer. Jesus gives a brand new and blessed identity to Peter. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. How did Peter see himself? How did others see Peter? Was his identity rooted in his vocation of a fisherman? Maybe it was based off, off of how well he was at the catch of the day or how well he maintained his boats. Or maybe Peter's identity was by his family, his, his father and his heritage. All of the world definitions, the earthly identity, all of that fades to the background and into the past when Jesus begins to identify him. You are no longer Simon, son of Jonah, but now you are going to be called a rock. Jesus is using an analogy and a play on words here as Peter literally means rock in that language. Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm going to use you as the foundation of my next phase of the kingdom. In this moment, Peter is giving his brand new identity, one that would shake him and shape him to his very core, to his very soul. Peter allows Jesus to identify him, and it changes his life for the better, and it affects how every part of his life is done. However, Peter hasn't fully grasped the identity of Jesus, and he, he fails to allow Jesus' own identity to describe him. Peter opens up his mouth again. Almost immediately, Peter begins thinking again of worldly definitions about, the, uh, about who the world told him the Messiah should be like and act like. In the worldly definition, the Messiah would never suffer, only rule and reign, and surely the Messiah would never die through peaceful surrender. No, he would conquer and bring the kingdom of Israel back to sovereignty. And yet Jesus prophesies one and not the other. Verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but the merely human ones. The harshest words, the greatest condemnation, the biggest slap that Jesus gives to anyone in his whole life is found here, directed at Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are my adversary. You are against me. Seconds ago, Jesus was handing the keys to heaven to Peter, and now he's calling him Satan? What's going on here? Jesus isn't getting confused about who Peter is. He's not confusing him with somebody else. He's not calling him the devil. He's saying, Peter, right now, you are acting as my adversary, as a roadblock. Peter is allowing the world to define what a Messiah should look like rather than allowing Jesus to identify what he looks like, acts like, and talks like. In Jesus' own words, Peter is only thinking about worldly human concerns. And if Jesus' followers allow the world to identify either themselves or Jesus, it causes the forfeiture of it all, the forfeiture of our own identity. It's all for nothing. So what does it look like to allow Jesus Christ to identify you and to reject the world's identity for you and Jesus? My friend Tammy answers that better than I ever could. Check out this video. Tammy uses the words, take up my cross, not because it's the words of our current series, but because those words have been her prayer for the last three years. She has allowed herself to be defined by the cross and by Jesus, not by her past, her previous addiction, and not by the world. 
Jesus sat her down, kneeled beside her, wiped the tears from her eyes, and freely gave her a new identity, a brand new life. The old has gone, and the new is here. Jesus gives you that same invitation today. Are you allowing the world to identify you? Are you allowing your past, your sin, your hangups to identify you? Have you felt the weight of a life not defined by Jesus on your shoulders? Jesus offers an open invitation for you to receive a brand new identity, one defined by the fact that Jesus loves you, he is for you, and that he will never forsake you. An identity defined by the fact that there is neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation that could be able to separate you from the love of God. Two ways for that new identity identity to be solidified within you. The first is to accept Jesus' identity for the first time. Say, Jesus, I want to be defined by you and by nothing else. We solidify that first-time decision through baptism. And if that's you, if you want to start that conversation, I would invite you to simply comment down below me. The second, if you've already made that first decision, but you still feel shackled by the world, your action step today would be to allow the Holy Spirit to rise up within you with specific areas of your world that you need to be reworked in your life so that they have the rightful place. And there are also things that are of this world that need to be gone from your personal world. And you need to allow the Holy Spirit to purge them from your life and from your soul. The things that need to be torn from who you are. We began our time together today asking the question, who are you? That answer isn't as important as this one. Who do you want to be? You do not have to be defined by the things that you came in with. Jesus is here among us right now, sitting with you, wanting and waiting for you to leave your identity in his hands. Who do you want to be? Jesus has an invitation for a defining moment to happen right here, right now. It was so great to read each of your comments today and stay connected with you, even though we're not in person. You can connect with us throughout the week on all our social media channels. We'll see you back here next week.